All right, you ready? Yeah, I'm very nervous. <laughs> You're gonna be amazing. <laughs> I'm letting everyone in. Hello, 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 greetings, good evening. Welcome to yet another Art Fair virtual studio visit slash artist talk interview. Tonight we have Heidi Norton. Hello, Heidi. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Yeah. So happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm Carolina Wheat. I'm an art fair curator. And uh, we're really rubbing up this conversation tonight to talk a little bit about not only Heidi's work, however, the process uh, of her work in relationship to the contents that she chooses, as well as her organic materials and the meaning that that has behind um, her influences and her upbringing and so on in her life. So we're really excited to have you. I know you got your MFA from AIC, you've taught in photography there, you're teaching in photography right now at FIT, uh, you've had a solo show at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, yeah, certainly um, gotten some love in France and you know you, you've been showing work in New York in, in group exhibitions as as well since you moved here from Chicago so we want to welcome you we're still admitting folks and with that how shall we begin where are you right now well presently I'm in Maryland at my parents house and um, it's really it's been nice to be here because I'm back in the landscape in which I grew up um, so that's been very inspiring. Um, and I just was able to build out a studio space in the basement. So, um, it's been nice to like, um, have a place to actually focus and work, um, as hard as that is. Um, a lot of our has been, but right now are kind of feeling that same, you know, they that left the city or haven't really been able to get to the studio if it's far or don't want to travel in the subway and so on. So it's, it is, um, it's nice to have you. And so, you know, you were going to be talking a little bit, but you'll also be showing images, um, from your studio in Brooklyn and as well as exhibitions, correct? Yes, yes, for sure. I'm going to be sharing um, a broad kind of, I think, a broad history of my practice um, because I think it, it, it really sh does everything. You know, it shows all my photographs. It shows how I got to working with sculpture and, um, and it shows a little bit about where I am now and what I'm thinking about. So, yeah, I'm really happy to, to be here. And I see familiar faces, too. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah, showing up. Well, let's get started, Heidi. I know that you've got this beautiful background behind you, virtual background of an installation that I know I, I got to see at IRL, which was at the Ace Hotel in um, Gramercy area in, in Manhattan. Maybe we can start talking a little about uh, what's over your shoulder. <laughs> yeah, don't let this fool you. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is an installation that was um, at, the ha at the Ace Hotel. I, got, I don't know how to turn this off here um at the ace hotel and um it uh sorry i'm trying to just turn these this i message off because it's very um it's very disruptive i think i figured it out so this was at the ace hotel um this time last year actually it opened in august and i'm going to talk a little bit about it later on in the slideshow but it was a fully immersive site specific work that i did that consists of wallpaper um, which was scans of surfaces of work. Um, oftentimes that my sculptures and photographs will fold in and out of one another. Um, it's also um, uh, an architectural um, response to the space as well. Um, and it includes sculptures as well as photographs mounted on top of the wallpaper. So it's meant to be very illusionistic. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to talk about it probably a little later on, if that's, if that's okay with you guys. <laughs> of course. Of okay. Course. Let's see you got cooking in this PowerPoint here. Okay. Um, whoops. Okay. So, okay. Okay, so aside from making work, I often uh, write as well. And I wanted to start off with this piece that I did for BOM. And 
late in 2018. Um, it's called The Faceless pa Plant, a sketch for Timothy Morton by, by me. Um, the book that I'm appropriating is called The Ecological Thought, and it's been a very influential book to my practice. Um, I think that it's a good starting point because it um, does a nice job introducing what I call the origin story of my work. Um, and I'm going to share with you a couple spreads throughout the slideshow, but I thought that I would start off just by reading a little bit from, from the, the text um, that I wrote. It's mostly st stuff that I wrote as well as um, other text that's been appropriated. Um, and the, there's footnotes and you can find the work online, um, but um, I'm just going to read a couple excerpts from that. Um, <clears throat> At one point long ago, there was no such thing as inside and outside. And then there was, and what we call nature was outside, plants and rocks and dirt, bees and rivers and et cetera. And they figured out to bring, they figured out how to bring it all home and name it and corral it into their gardens and put us up on shelves. And that's a quote from a text, a, a piece of actual project that I did with Karsten Long called After the Fires of the Little Sun. I now mostly sit on the shelves of department stores, waiting for humans to use me to greenwash their homes. But I am native to the new tropics, and for centuries I was used as a magic plant to expel bad influences. My closest companions were the strawberry poison frogs, the Ufaga pomlio, who deposit their tadpoles on my leaf axles. We have a symbiotic relationship. I also have a dark side and it's not because I chose it. Humans have nicknamed me the mother's tongue and I can use I can cause temporary inability to speak. They have used the microscopic needles of calcium oxalate in my stalk as poison. From natives to slaves to Nazi Germans to people tampering with evidence or committing suicide, humans have figured out ways to use my natural defenses for their own defense and for evil. This ghostly nature inhibited the growth of the ecological thought. But these stories are for another day. I am here, well, at least my ghost is, to tell you about how my life changed that one day in the late spring of 2010. I was sitting on a pallet crammed in between a bunch of palms at the Home Depot. A lady came by and plucked me away and stuffed me in the back of a hot moving vessel. I arrived in what seemed to be a warm, airy, and sunlit space, where I lived for several months growing quite green and lush, until one day when she took me down and started painting a cold, gooey material on my epidermis. All over, she covered me with this material. I later found out it was latex paint. Covering the leaves with a substance made of petroleum equals covering me with Vaseline. Have you ever heard of such a thing? It will close the stomata openings. Stomata assist in the gaseous exchange and water evaporation or loss from leaf surfaces in transpiration and photosynthesis. Gradually, I will cease metabolic activity resulting in my death. I will be the ghost of nature. So this piece is called Whitescape, and this is the piece that that, core, that bottom section of text is referencing. The, the plant that's hanging on the left-hand side is the Diffenbachia that I painted completely white. And um, this piece was, at the time I was teaching color theory at SAIC, and I was um, reading Chromophobia with my class by David Batchelor. And there's a chapter in the book called Whitescape, and he goes on to talk about how a white cube can, um, in, in going, immersing yourself in a completely white space, cr causes this disruption in viewing. And I was constructing these sets at, in my studio, and I actually have been constructing sets when I graduated from undergrad from University of Maryland in the photo department. So I'm trained as a photographer and went to SAA SAIC for grad school in photography and went and later started teaching there. Um, but I was shooting these with a view camera and th because of the view camera, the way that it can skew perspective and the way that I was using light and color, I really started to become fascinated with how it was, it was, it was very kind of hard to understand where space started and where it end, ended. And I went on to make several of these um, what I call the New Age Still Life Project. And there are, again, a series of photo photographs that um, are used, the objects that I'm using in the photographs are 
um, objects that I had found in my parents' attic. Um, my parents were back to the land movers in the late 60s, early 70s. And um, they kind of lived a completely different life than it seems like they live now. Um, and a lot of these like artifacts and relics were hidden away in their, in their attic. And I know I was home and I, and I decided to collect a bunch of them and take them into the studio and start constructing these sets. Um, I spent mm, at least a year to a year and a half making these. They're all shot with a four by five view camera. Um, and they use various, you know, objects that have been deconstructed from them. Um, and then again, arranged um, in the studio and then photographed. Um, then I left over the summer and I worked on this project where I was traveling around the land that I grew up in, um, which is in the Mid-Atlantic. And this project is called the Underground Railroad Series, where I'm photographing, again, this and, and kind of looking at the history of this land and, and this kind of dark, ugly history and how the landscape has been laden. Um, not all dark, but the reason why I say dark is because there's also the Antietam battlefield here. Um, and it was one of the, the bloodiest battles of the, the Civil War. Um, but these, these two, I'm oh, sorry, these two pieces, this one is called Harriet Tubman's Birthplace. And this one is um, called the, is just called Antietam. Um, and when I, re when I returned back to the studio after shooting this project, um, and I'm gonna circle back later on to talking a little bit about the landscape in which I grew up in, but I wanted to give you just like a kind of quick introduction to where it is. It's in West, originally I grew up in West Virginia and then later moved to um, Maryland, um, which is on the, the part of Maryland that touches the panhandle of West Virginia. Um, but when I got back from the studio, I'm gonna read just this excerpt down here from this, this is another spread from Bomb. I walked back into the studio and looked around. There was the, Diffenbachia, her white leaves limp, but shooting out of her center was a new sprout. The latex paint had caused the plant to die off while giving life to a new offspring. That was it. This tenuous rebirth of the Diffenbachia became an origin story of sorts and continued my investigation of the cycles of ecological change. Through the evolving combination of organic materials, photography, and sculpture, my work speaks to the instability and liminality of time while investigating ideas of preservation through material and modes of display. Once you start to think it, you can't unthink it. And that's a quote from The Ecological Thought by Timothy Morton. Ivy, could you go back to the um, New Age still life images of the, the, yes. Sure, and then this is that piece from the, this is another piece that kind of last piece from the New Age still life where you can see the Diffenbachia here again and you have a new sprout of life um, growing out while simultaneously these like, um, these encrusted, uh, painted pieces, which are very interesting, like preserved. I really liked like the decay inside of them, but yet they were kind of almost ceramic, looked like ceramic, like um, kind of, um, yeah, these like ceramic pieces that were kind of dropping off of this piece. So there was this duality between life and death that I found to be very interesting and, preserv and preserving too. Um, did you want me to flip back to some of them? No, well, if, if, if you'd like, great. I, I was mostly interested in asking question concerning the actual installation of the work you know the the work is a, the photograph correct yet you're creating these sculptural reliefs on the wall you're painting you're collaging montaging and you're adding all these elements from your parents you know personal belongings to uh pieces from the landscape you're uh, addressing in west virginia uh, and I'm, I'm curious as those objects are, and those objects contain the energy that which creates the photograph, um, what happens to them? Are you, you know, you, you, I know that you work in editions, correct? This one was mm -hmm. editioned, uh, yet the actual structure itself, uh, when you dismantle it, the objects, do you repurpose them or uh, how do you attend to the actual objects? post photograph? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, often the objects will move around into other works. So sometimes, um, for instance, this piece, a lot of these white um, leaf, 
the leaves that dropped off that kind of were preserved in this latex paint were often reconfigured into other still lives um, or sculptures when I start working on sculptures. Um, and uh, same with the, the sh everything would always kind of be in flux moving around. So the shelves would kind of resurface in another piece. Um, and then later on, when I start working, and when I start working in sculpture, you'll find that the sculptures will often be deconstructed and cycled into, into other into other photographs or into other sculptures. So there's always this kind of shifting around whether I'm building something like this to kind of be photographed or whether the sculptures are kind of being deconstructed to be to photograph. There's a, a shifting back and forth between the image and the object. And it's sometimes hard to even understand it in, in the slideshow. <laughs> well, I know your work is, you know, it's so tangible and, and um, with all its materials as we move forward, the, the observation I just want to attend to is the term ghost that you're using uh, and relationship to life and death. And mm -hmm. so, you know, kind of getting to the nitty gritty of repurposing the objects into different installations to create new life in a photograph. I'm, I'm just really interested in the, this theory that you're using uh, with the live materials of plants, yet you're also preventing them from living <laughs> at times. So, you know, just, yeah. I, I'm interested if you could address this idea of ghosts a little bit more in depth. Well, the ghosting, I mean, I think with this, this uh, segment of text that I was referring to um, in the book, when I'm talking, when I'm kind of um, riffing off of his terms of ghost nature and in a kind of literal way, um, but also I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the plant as a ghosting as well and having this like several kind of generations that it's cycling through right and like is does it become a completely new plant right so here you see in this piece this still life in the studio you see the plant now reincarnated for the third time into a brand new plant so it goes from you know the the one the one sorry i don't know why i can't get this arrow thing the one stalk jutting out here to completely shedding everything and and kind of reforming itself into a whole nother plant in a sense um and i think there's yeah i think there's also a lot of kind of a history late you know that's kind of embedded in the objects as well as they resurface through other other pieces absolutely and i appreciate that you use the word reincarnates <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's definitely a lot of reincarnation. Yeah, and so this is like my first, um, tr my first go at sculpture. So it was I had been trying to figure out for a long time how to get this, how to get these images off of the wall, and I didn't want to, you know, I was already creating these kind of sets, so to speak, and I didn't want to re put, you know, put them back into a gallery. I didn't think that that was interesting at all, and so because I have, um, it's it's harder for me to work because I come from a photo background, a two D background. It's really hard for me to kind of push off into the floor, and so this was a great easy way for me thinking about glass is like, um, you know, is it this very distinct two D surface how do it's also used to cover and protect photographs frequently and so using the glass here I also you know as a child I had this field guide and I was constantly pressing plants in this field guide and I actually had found it when I was going through my my stuff in my parents attic and their stuff and um, I was like what about like a pressed uh, like a huge pressed plant like what if I took one of these and I instead of using latex paint I used resin and I was thinking about its relationship to like amber and sap and what if I like try to preserve it and in, in, embed it in this, like, you know, or press it against this glass and like really kind of suffocate it. And, um, and so here you can see again, like there are so many strong, there's so many for me visual references between the photograph and this, this piece that I call Michael. Um, and, uh, and this was also at the time where I was leaving the roots exposed. So I was really trying to keep it green for as long as I could. And it was, these pieces became really anxiety inducing because I would constantly be going back and forth to the studio to try to keep the, the plant alive. And, um, 
and it was like futile, you know what I mean? But there was something in that process that was really intriguing to me until it just completely stressed me out. Um, but this piece is like, you know, I often think of these as half photographs, half sculpture, because on the one side, it really is photographic. Um, and the plant really is like pressed hard. And then on the other side, it's quite um, three dimensional. Um, and this was another iteration of an early sculptural work too, where um, I am using the glass more as a transparent vehicle, whereas the other one, they're much more opaque. And I'm also experimenting with like ways of displaying the work. Um, but this one to me was very much like a large pressed plant. Um, Part of the idea of wanting to keep it alive intrigues me hearing you say that life was color and you, the green was you know the life and therefore you know this stress that was induced by trying to keep that green alive uh was it in these works that you kind of just decided that you know if i'm going to be working with living material i'm going to need to uh, um, accept the fact that the work changes with time and these works almost become this kind of performative sculpture in, in relationship yeah. to plants. Yeah, it took me some time to get to that. I think a lot, there was a couple things that were an issue with it because I was making the piece and green was like a color that was primarily like it was part of the color palette, you know what I mean? And when green turns to brown, they're just aesthetically and working with color, it becomes something different. And that was one thing. And then the other thing was, you know, I think we have all these strong associations with like death and decay and, the, and, and something when it's not green, it's, you know, it doesn't, in, in the plant world, it doesn't feel like it's alive, you know what I mean? And it's dead and we don't, and like we have an inversion with death, right? And so, you know, I think there, that was another thing. And um, just thinking of it as ugly, you know, um, quote unquote, and um and it took me a while to like embrace that. And it actually became really important to the work because then it did really much become about cycling around, you know, cycling from life and death and this larger like idea of like ecological cycles from, from life to death and then some of them even regenerating. Um, and so um, that like became like what the work ultimately became, you know, became about. It wasn't necessarily just showing like a green life of a green plant that was alive. Um, and so these, I think, are a good, a good example of that, too, where um, I started making these wax works. My parents were beekeepers, and also because um, my relationship to the land that I grew up in, um, it's a, there's a lot of limestone there, and, and then limestone, these limestone cliffs and quarries were, were I'm going to circle back to them later on, too, were very important to me growing up. And um, I, I felt like these wax pieces really felt like of the earth they very they very much felt like sedimentary rock um and um like if you look at there's none here but if you look at the side of them and the layering of the wax it, it feels like that and the also there they held a density to them that was very important when i juxtapose them against the glass um, and so you'll see that later when the glass and the wax merge together. Here's me looking annoyed at my pictures being taken <laughs> in the studio. But um, you can see here in the studio, I like to include a shot because, you know, obviously I'm working on a piece and you can see the molds and such, but also because there's all these armatures. It, it, the, the studio really came this strange hybrid between um, a photography studio and a um, sculpture studio that consists of dirt and greens and plants and a kind of a greenhouse so to speak um and and, it, that, and if anyone yeah <laughs> toxic, you know, with resin and if anyone knows anything about you know like tons of i'm sure you all photography and working with film like all you do is try to keep dust away and dirt right and um and so it was this weird like hyper um juxtaposed thing between like dirt resin toxic and natural and film and analog and and so i i really started like digging it though um so that's that and then the pieces got bigger um this is a really large like 32 inch high by by 24 inch um wide piece you can see here i start experimenting with like mounting the work this is on a platform um i also have been started experimenting with the surfaces of the work so i i really um what i got away like what i enjoyed about this piece is that 
it starts to look like uh, skin and um, through the use of the tarp. So this is also an introduction, like you can see the tarp, the, the idea of like, not plastic, just not in the resin form, but you'll start seeing it in vinyl and tarps as well, being introduced to the, to the making part or even just as a material. And then this is a, this is, sorry for the, the kind of bad quality here, but this is a, this is the first iteration of where the wax pieces, um, what I call kind of of the earth, um, intersect literally with the glass pieces and they become kind of part armature, but also and originally they were designed and fabricated thinking about them as armature, but they very much become part of the work later on. And, um, you start to see like a distinct relationship between like the glass as a transparent mode, a reflective mode, a way of like working with light and plants. And then that juxtaposed against these like dense and also hidden inside of all of these, what I call wax of the earth time capsules are embedded plants. And so they're doing their own like cycling through in this invisible state um, and, um, and going through like these modes of decay. Um, and Oftentimes that also changes, changes the work. Um, and I think this is the, uh, the beginning of where I'm starting to think about all the precariousness of the work too. Like it being in flux, it also kind of being in limbo and how it kind of hangs or, or juts out of this wax um, pillar. And um, yeah, and I think herbarariums are obvious, like an obvious reference point here. So kind of, again, pushing on different modes of display, thinking about museological ways of display and also preser preservation. Well, I remember speaking to you one time about um, some of these large, larger scale works in glass, almost like a slide capturing this um, micro, microorganisms or, or, or giant organisms in what could be like a, a in slide format and as they are glass and that fragility, the ecosystem being caught within the, the panes of glass, I can definitely see how these are a little tricky to be moving around. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> as well as, um, you know, kind of positioning them in such a way that they are, present with their space uh, because they are translucent or transparent at times that light is so important and where the light is coming from it just like it, it it works well with photography as well you know thinking thinking of that slide factor your handmade slides yeah that's a really great point because later on you know this is uh, again, where I'm starting to think a little bit about, like I was saying, like modes of display, especially ways that uh, museums, natural museums, natural history museums, et cetera, preserve works. Um, and you'll see later on in, in the piece that we sh I showed with you guys that um, at Elijah Wheat is that, that I really kind of um, use the metal armature where the stands change and they become these almost like slide trays. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so... Yeah, I think um, I oftentimes think of them in that way. Yeah, as, as ways of kind of classifying materials to um, organizing, you know, and um, yeah, and, and, and then like, how do museums, you know, preserve, right? And like, what does that preservation mean in terms of time and in and, and just the natural world? Um, I don't, how did this little black line appear here? I don't know where that came from. <laughs> um, so this is, um, I wanted to show you guys this piece too. So on the left is a um, installation at the, uh, this is a solo show at the, the, the Museum of Temporary Art. And um, it's one room, it was two rooms. And um, on the right here in this little like silly thumbnail or the smaller four by six image here is me in my studio holding up a piece of resin that was peeled off of another um, piece of glass from a previous show. Um, you can see here directly adjacent to it a photograph of that um, where it's been kind of cleaned and cleaned up and sterilized. Oftentimes I think of the photographs, you know, these works are sometimes scrunky and oozy and goozy and viscous and meant to look like they're in a constant state of wetness sometimes, the sculptures that is, whereas I love 
for me in my own practice, I really enjoy how the photographs kind of clean it up and sterilize it to a certain degree. Um, but I wanted to show this as a kind of example of, of the kind of cycling, a direct example of the cycling of materials in and out of my work. And this is um, a photograph. Um, so along these lines, I was also building these transparent boxes in my studio, these really large multi-plane transparent kind of display boxes um, and, that were like really intricately designed and then laser cut and had all these shells with slots and, and objects would go on top of them and then be photographed in these multi-plane or plane um, four by five images and here um this is a you know a piece that's been completely deconstructed and then rephotographed in one of these um uh display boxes so it's really hard to see where the space is uh, starting and ending especially with the shifting with a view camera of the perspective you know the ability to do that as well as play with the depth of field and these are actually that one previously is very small it's like an eight by ten um and then they were shown along these really really large photographs um, this one is quite big. Um, this is another um, uh, sculptural piece that's been removed from a piece of glass, set up in a studio, and then um, appropriated. So, and then rephotographed. Um, and this one's called Snake Skins. Do you know how to get this little marker off here by chance? <laughs> do you guys see that, or is it just me? Something to do with the annotating. Uh, um, that's right. Should I just keep going? Um, this is um, a large piece. Um, this was in the other room at the MCA, uh, Museum of Temporary Art in Chicago. So um, you'll see here, again, this is another one that's completely painted white where the plant has sprouted out a new like life. Um, and the other side of this piece is completely flat. So when the viewer um, walked up, sorry, walked up to the piece, um, they were confronted with this piece here on the far left, which is um, more like a, a, a painting. Um, and so again, it looked very two dimensional. And as they circled around to the other side of the work, um, they came to see this. And um, these, this show was really important for me too. Um, obviously it was like a big career show um, and it marked a certain point, but um, it also, it also was like the first show that I've had I had where I worked with really large glass. I mean, these pieces were like 12 feet tall um, and they really um, started speaking to the figure and the viewer and the body of the viewer and the, the surface as the as the plants decayed um, became, you know, the surface was very reflective. And so the pe the viewers were able to kind of look at themselves layered against like the death or cycling of these plants. And um, that was important for me. It also was a site-specific a, a site work too, where I made these glass pieces and the loading dock there at the museum because the glass was recycled from Liam Gillick's vitrines. And so the fact that it came from his work and from a vitrine um, was also important to the pieces. Um, and um, you can see here, there's also this um, glass, another, or, you know, another piece where I'm having the glass kind of wedged into the wax. Um, here's that photograph that I was showing you before. It's quite large. And then these are the smaller ones that I was talking about with the shards of glass. Um, this, this show also showed a lot of death in the, the works as well. So the viewer was, you know, again, confronted with that. It was up for a really long time. So it was another type of thing where the viewer could come back and return to the work and slowly see these, these, um, the work um, in flux. So did you, t did you take install shots at the beginning and the middle end like in terms of getting some of the process of, of the decay? Yes. So the photographer, um, the official photographer photographed it more, you know, closer to the beginning. You can see some of the plants decaying and then I photographed it. Yeah. Throughout the, the course of the show. I don't have any of those in here, unfortunately, but yeah, it was something that was documented throughout the show. Yeah, I'm sure we can get the picture. It's just, I just, I'm so interested in the cycling as well. Al Alexandra Hammond also says, these are so beautiful. I love oh. that and cycling. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is also, um, I think, an important point where, you know, because of the scale of those pieces were so, the scale was so large that I also, I start thinking about um, the idea of the glass 
you know, the glass in, in terms of how it's used in architecture, right? And like how it's used in windows and what does that mean um, with these works? And um, so this is an intervention in a warehouse um, that was used, it was still in, in, in working and operating, but it was mostly storage, this man that had a big, huge collection of treasures, not junk, um, that he often sold to anyone. Um, and the show was called Welcome to the Warehouse, uh, Welcome to the Neighborhood, sorry. And um, this, the, 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 the warehouse was slated to, to be demolished. And so um, his daughter is a curator at SF MoMA now, but she, she um, we, you know, was friends of ours and was like, hey, would you guys be interested in having a show at my dad's warehouse? And so this, this is a huge photograph printed on Duratran. Um, it's, it's like, um, Again, maybe like uh, 20, 20 feet tall. Um, it's printed in panels. Um, and so you can see it's kind of attached and it becomes part of the scrim here. <clears throat> and so that brings me to this, this exhibition. This is um, a show called Prismatic Nature that I had at Elmhurst Art Museum. Um, it was the last show that I had in Chicago before moving to New York. <sighs> it was a really, really, um, uh, ex extensive show and that it um, consisted of uh, 20 of these window inserts um, that went into the into the window into the architecture and then they um, Elmer's Heart Art Museum if anyone knows it has one of Mies van der Rohe's original track housing um, uh, called the McCormick House it was a prototype and they house that's connected to the museum. And so I curated a show in there of other st of student work, um, as well as specimens from museums that were on the campus around here. So there was um, a green a botanical garden there, as well as a gym museum, a gym and stone museum. So they both lent me, uh, um, lent me things from their collection. And I also um, curated um, artwork, student, like I was saying, student work that focused around the Bauhaus. Um, and so this exhibition here, um, the windows, the window scrims. Um, so Mies van der Rohe, as you know, was very much about um, how do we bring nature in, right? That was one of his quotes. And, um, and um, you know, um, the Elmhurst has a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright's helms there. And one of the helms there is, is like where he talks a lot about the history of his scrims and these like window window um, pieces that he did. And so I thought that the, that was inspiring. This is also the exhibition where I circle back to my, my history, my own like personal narrative and my parents' history. Um, and so you'll see a lot of the materials that are used that are kind of collaged in these window inserts reference my childhood um, and my parents' history. So for instance, this left, or I'm sorry, the right hand um, screen, scrim here, or window insert is um, a piece of paper that I found in one of my dad's books with um, a book list um, from the early 70s. Um, this is um, some, um, pseudo chlorophyll that I made and scanned. Um, and this here is a t-shirt that I still have of my mom. It's like tie dye that she wore when I was a kid every day that I had scanned and um, made into, um, you know, a, a material. Um, and um, this is a photograph of me. Um, there was a time where I did this residency where I um, was working outside in, in this natural, this driftless land of Wisconsin that was very similar to where I grew up. And I built this studio in the woods. You don't see the actual studio here, the structure, because I hadn't got there. But this is a portrait of me by one of my former students, Eileen Miller, um, who came to be a great friend and colleague um, of me. It's called Portrait of Heidi Working on Cobra Lily Mountain. And it's um, this sketch on the right is from a book of my parents that I found on um, how to build a shelter in the woods. Um, when my parents moved to West Virginia in the late 60s, they bought the plot of land off out of Mother Earth magazine without even seeing it. And they hitchhiked down there and um, they built this lean-to um, in the woods. And um, it really didn't turn out well. Um, it, it was a very, um, 
dystopian experience. And they, they moved us later to West Virginia to a log cabin that my dad built, which turned out to be a wonderful experience. But this is a camera obscura that um, was that I built on the landscape. Um, and this is the image from the camera obscura here. It's modeled and based off of the um, plan that my parents used to build their lean to in the woods. This is a trading post that was built um, based off of Mies van der Rohe, some of his um, floor plans that have been modified and the viewers could come in, take stuff out and leave things. This is, um, my parents um, were really into the Foxfire books and um, they had several editions of them. And one of the um, chapters is called Planting by the Signs. And it talks about the zodiac signs and what obviously to plant during what, what part of the year in terms of the zodiac. These are um, cyanotypes that have been scanned and blown up. I'm not cyan cyanotypes, but um, photograms. Um, and this is the floor plan to Mies van der Rohe's um, McCormick house. And then this is just a quick, quick sorry, go um, ahead. A okay, quick question about materials. The these are paste or they're 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 sticky vinyl. It's like sandwiched between some of your um, photograms you said or different types of other debris and things that you're placing inside the or against the window and the sticky vinyl? Is that how you're creating each of these windows? No, these are um, photographs printed and then they are resined, adhered to um, most, some of these are photographs like this one, this one, and this one. Mm -hmm. They are printed and then adhered to um, thick um, uh, acrylic and then inserted into the window panes. Um, and then some of them are just, um, are plants collaged onto the surface. And then these, sorry, I didn't explain, but these are acrylic boxes um, that are hanging suspended from the ceiling. Okay, so the, 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 the acrylic with the resin coated um, compositions, montages and photographs then serve as the window or was the glass removed? Or it was it just this? No, it's like sandwiched, pressed against. See these little clips here? Yeah. They're held in place through these clips. So, okay, so they're actually that can be repurposed or re, you know, it, provided the window is the same size, but the, they're actual objects, not just stickers that can be thrown away later or something. Exactly. That it's, it's not just a site specific installation. Interesting. Yeah, they're actual, yeah, inserts um, of large acrylic inserts, yeah. So um, this is the McCormick house, um, the living, like part of the living room section of the McCormick house. And you can see I made a glass, circular glass piece here. Um, it turned, I my goal here was to turn it into a half, like a kind of um, pseudo um, or a kind of mix between a study, a greenhouse, and a um, yeah, kind of a study greenhouse type of thing slash gallery. Um, and so you can see here all of the specimens from the Lazardra. There's some specimens here from the actual collection there of the museum, um, and Rock Museum. And then there's also um, you know other books. Um, and things that come from my own research, my own personal collection. So all of these books up here were things that, that I have used to, you know, research my own work and reference in my practice. And then you can see like some of these are some of my sculptures in the cases. And then these are some artworks of former students um, that are artists, practicing artists now. And then this is a glass piece that, um, that we were talking about earlier um, that looks kind of like it's placed in a slide tray. It's called the Museum Archive dedicated to Edward Steichen. And um, Edward Steichen had the first plant exhibition at MoMA in 1936. And he um, was, the, it was the photography curator at the time there and he convinced them to let the museum uh, display his delphinium collection. So he had a, just a showing of his plants. There's great images online if you want to look it up. Um, and so it's meant to look like an enlarged slide tray. Like if you opened up a slide tray at a field museum and you pulled it out and it's this, you know, it's super big. 
There's um, reflective and different types of glass that's used on it. So it really creates these strange like optical illusions. Um, when you look at it from, it's really hard to ever take it in in like one vantage point. It's a, you know, you look at it from the anterior view, you can look at it at the side. And I really like this image of it because it's layered against Mises windows, which were a very important part of these homes architecturally. <clears throat> Um, and I just want to circle back to like where I grew up in the land. So this is me canoeing in a cave. So um, there I grew up on this quarry in West Virginia in the Panhandle, West Virginia, after my parents, um, you know, their failed attempts living off this land down in southern West Virginia in the Appalachia, they moved up north to um, to uh, the Panhandle of West Virginia, right about where it touches Maryland. And my dad built us a log cabin on this 10, 10 acres of land that butted up to a quarry. This quarry was huge. It, it was an old limestone quarry that flooded in the 60s, but it um, had all these crazy for miles and miles of underground caverns. And so when we were little, my parents would take us canoeing through the caves. And so caves have become a very important part of my life. And, you know, there are a lot of cave structures that were used here during the Underground Railroad. Um, for, um, you know, Harriet Tubman and other John Brown, people um, would hide the freedom fighters, you know, they were used as hideouts as well. And um, this quarry is very important to like my life and the history of my work. And, you know, I, I, it's, I learned to swim here and jump off cliffs and it was just like a, a very important part of like my childhood. Um, so I just wanted to like kind of throw those in. Um, this show is an exhibition that was last year in Chicago called New Age, New Age, Strategies of Survival. And it was curated by Julia Rodriguez Winholm. And this is a, I thought a, um, a nice example of again, working um, with the sculptures in an architectural um, space and using the light to activate the work because light as important it is to photography is obviously very important to the plants and the glass and you know the illusions that are created in the glass and um and oftentimes i will show it juxtaposed against um photographs um and these are photographs that were shot in the studio of sculptures that had been deconstructed and then reconfigured in the studio and then photographed again that show was just exquisite there were so many incredible artists predominantly female uh and and that curator or the uh the gallery director it's depaul museum correct in chicago yeah exactly yeah it's a beautiful space mm -hmm. I just announced today that she's going to uc berkeley uh, oh my god i missed that i know i know i was thinking of this show actually when i saw that she announced that she's just she's really progressive and incredible game changer when it comes to um, some real risk-taking exhibitions. I was glad to see this in real life with all the other artists, but also the way the your work was uh, positioned, it's kind of hard to see, but that, that's the train, that's the L right there. And so if you're at the Fullerton stop, the Brown Line, you can see very clearly the work through the window of providing this fantastic accessibility, but this fantastic uh, uh, irony of, you know, the window from the window to the window to the glass to the, you know, and the nature's inside the museum where they're, it, it just was just a nice, uh, um, meta experience but yeah. I yeah this is um also i i wanted to talk about <clears throat> you know the the anxiety around like keeping the plan alive again so um you know i've gone through different feelings with that and some of the things that kind of resurface in my mind are like people that want to buy this work but they don't necessarily want the responsibility of like taking care of a plant um, or they don't really like the unpredictability of like where the plant's going to go, right? And so this plant, so I've experimented around with different ways of using the plants in the work. And this particular plant has um, the floral vials, you know, if you get a bouquet, it has the little vials kind of drilled into the glass and they kind of shoot out perpendicular with these anthuriums that were replaced like two times throughout the course of the show as well as the pothos is sitting in um, a test tube. You can see it a little bit down here. So it has a watering system. Um, 
this is also the beginning point where I start to use um, plastic and uh, plastics as a casting material too, not just as like um, a way of adhering things to the surface. So this is all casts of bubble wrap. And I liked also symbolically like the bubble wraps used like to protect things. Same as like tarps and greenhouses. Um, uh, this is an installation that's behind me. <laughs> um, this is at the Ace Hotel in New York. Um, when I went into the Ace Hotel, I really was trying to dive deeper into the history of the space. The, it's a weird little, their gallery is this weird kind of transit space between the lobby, which is super dark, and this boutique on the other side. Um, and so I really, it was like, it felt like this strange portal, like this weird, like liminal in between space. I didn't really understand, um, even as like an art space. And so the archways, I don't know. I just like looked at the archways and I was thinking about like what the space meant and like leaving it and going into this super dark space. And then I was like, well, what if you could like exit this way, like exit stage, right? and go into this beautiful wooded forest where this sculpture of mine is like living and breathing. So these archways, just to give you like a, these are all Photoshop. So I photographed these archways and then through Photoshop, I recreated them um, on the wallpaper. So um, none of, nothing here is physical. Um, except these sculptures that are layered on top of it. So there's this sculpture, a very small one, this like long, um vertical um one and then this more square one here with the with the palms pressed against it the surface i like to call the the mesh of the work um is all scans of my and photographs of my work and so you if you look at like this I'll sh it'll come up again later this like weird root hook um, you'll see later in an actual physical sculpture as same as this is an installation of um a sculpture in the woods and um, yeah, this, pe this, this installation was called Prisms. And so on this side, you see this illusionistic kind of escapey, escape route to this other world. And then on the other side, across from it are these, the, the two um, photographs from the New Age still life. And here are some detail shots of that, of the, the sculptures. Sometimes I will show sculptures on shelves like this. Um, for this show, I had to because the, the space was such a, 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 a walkway that was used so frequently that I felt kind of strange having glass sculptures in the middle of it, um, it which ended up being a good decision because later on some stuff got damaged. <laughs> oh gosh, I didn't realize that. I mean, I What's was, that? I, I didn't realize anything was damaged, but I knew it was a public space and it was up for two months or 30 days. How long was it up? Yeah, it ended up being almost two months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is, um, you'll see here, I oftentimes will um, incorporate my four by five. Here's a sheet of film from a New Age Still Life image. Um, I often use like optical glass. This is castings of resin that look like, you know, beehive or some type of relationship to bee, um, beehives or not hives, but um, hexa, you know, like parts of beehives. And this is um, a test tube with a piece of bamboo in it. Um, uh, so this is, um, a exhibition that I had in Chicago called, um, to Threptacon. And so this is that same glass piece here. Um, and then this is, um, another sculpture. I'll show you a detail of it a little bit later on. Um, it, these are photographs printed on glass. These are cast glass with objects embedded. And then there's two more traditional photographs here. I'll show you in a minute. But again, this is the Peace Museum archive dedicated to Edward Steichen. Um, and um, this was um, a, a, a show that really I was pushing hard on the materiality of glass um, and thinking about it as a medium, but also um, it was about conceptually about plants extraordinary abilities like for instance to um, the spider ward to signal radiation um, the indian pipe which is a chlorophyllous plant um, and the aridapodus um, and so it really kind of and this show again this piece was to kind of highlight and one of the things was to highlight edward steichen's um, delphinium collection and this is another shot um, of the glass pieces and the photographs here on the side. And then this is a um, detail of the photograph on the right. 
Heidi, you have, um, you know, the plants' names down and such, but I'm wondering through, is it just experience uh, working with the plants that you've uh, been able to really uh, learn about them? Or have you taken any formal educational courses like in botanical gardens or horticulture? Have you, have you spent any um, academic time with plants? Not really. I mean, for this show, I talked to a lot of plant scientists and scientists that really work around um, plant signaling and the ability of plants to like the pea plant to like warn um, the shoots, you know, like to kind of signal underground to warn of impending um, drought, right? Um, and, uh, and people that study plants in that way. Um, but I've never officially formally taken a class, just like lots of own research on my, you know, on my own time working around like, you know, themes of shows or things that I'm interested in. Um, so later on in the work, you'll start to see where I start pushing, I really get into the surface of the works and thinking about like how the resin creates this, like what would I call sometimes as photorespiration or this like trapping of air under the surface. It looks like sometimes that the plants are breathing. Um, this one um, becomes much more bodily and more fluid like um it has these things that kind of look like tongues and ekg um uh sensors and and um it also is uh the beginning point another point where i'm pushing on like test tubes and ways of keeping the plants alive um and this one was made in france it's a site specific work um around the marshes in this plant town that i went to bourges and the waterways there um, so I collected the materials on site. And again, this is another part, another piece where I'm kind of using like lines and dirt sand to create compositions. I have a quick question for you. Uh, I think it's quick. I mean, when, you, when you think about selling these works, these larger scale sculptures, do you give instructions or production instructions to your uh, gallery or slash, you know, to the collector saying like, or really the ability to swap in and out some of these plants like are do some of them contain those little votives or um betweens where you can put water and and keep the life of the plant or does it just evolve into the decay oops sorry oops sorry you were cutting out and i, I missed that last part of the question can you repeat it real quick sorry Oh, it's okay. I was just wondering around uh, if uh, you create any work that has a type of small vase or cylinder that you can put water and, you know, keep any type of plants alive in the work. Yeah. So that piece, those pieces have the vials and then the test tubes for like, you know, thinner, stockier types of plants. Yeah. Um, the, um, I'll show, I'll get to a piece in a little bit where I start making cast pots and like the plants will have complete submergence of you know dirt inside of them sometimes i'll also just resin the root system in in the dirt with the dirt around it um to the piece and oftentimes we'll spray the piece throughout the duration of the show too yeah i just want to let you know that you've got a little under five minutes okay i'm almost done so this piece is called underground colonies it's meant to kind of visually represent um uh, ant colonies um, here I start, these are um, photographs mounted, um, resin, uh, printed, I'm sorry, photographs printed to vinyl and then resin to glass. Um, here's more of them. They were meant to be kind of prototypes for larger sculptures that I ended up actually showing. Um, this is um, another one of the wax tablets. Um, these, this is a new piece that I made. Um, here you can see there's also a wax tablet. You're able to see the side view of it, but it's a candle. So um, it's meant to burn and completely to self-destruct, revealing like this stuff that's hidden, embedded inside over the course of a show. Um, and then oftentimes I'll experiment with different modes of display on the wall. So these are hung perpendicular and this one on the left is hung over the head, but you can also see the little vial tips like sticking out. This one also has a watering system. Same, um, these are also perpendicular wall pieces that can be in, put in, in different configurations. Wow. So this one, um, Carolina, has a plant, a pot in it. This, this one has a pot in it. So you can see it has like a root system. It gets watered and the plant lives throughout, throughout the show. Yeah. Um, 
I love that. I have a quick question from one of our audience members. Dakota is asking, uh, it, it, it may be a long question, but maybe just sum up. Can you talk about your material research, like the process of finding your plastics, colorful gels, glass, et cetera? Uh, thank you and beautiful work. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. So the resin I've been working with for long periods of time. And so often I'll experiment with different dyes and I'll actually pour, that's a very good question because I'll pour some of these casting, these like more earthly looking forms. Um, I'll pour a lot of that stuff out on glass and in molds first and I'll kind of collect it. And then I'll, you know, like a collage artist would do, I'll kind of assemble it around. Um, what was the other one? The, the colors. Um, so the colors, the palette of colors that I use will often be like inspired by nature. So like right now, because I'm here at my parents, I'll ask, actually go out into like um, plants and kind of try to pull extracted like color relationships out of like natural material, you know, natural things. Um, what was the other one that she asked about the resin? Same with the wax. I try to kind of have cover com combinations that are inspired, but I oftentimes will put these like hyper artificial splashes of color into the pieces as well to kind of layer or juxtapose on top. Mm -hmm. um, I think I just have a couple more. This is a, a photosynthesis. This is a light sensitive thread that changes in the sun. It's a... Um, uh, Darwin's studies of plant movement. You guys should look it up. It's um, he did early studies of plants um, and how they move over the course of 24 hours. It's a it's a, a thread um, on linen, and this is a photograph and an installation. Um, you can see here the glass pieces are placed on um, these platforms, and from this anterior vantage point, sitting in this one exact place, the composition is arranged through your um, eyes <clears throat> and your experience in the show. And then these are those two pieces. I just want to show you another view. I'm getting ready to show these at Grimm Gallery, um, another iteration of this one. Um, but this is the um, museum archive from different vantage points. And then this is the wax um, piece with the elliptical disc. Um, and these are all things that I made um, in, this, in the studio, like these weird little um, clumps of dirt. And then I wanted to show this one last because I'm working on something like this now. Um, this is that piece that was collaged, photo montaged in that wallpaper, but it's a piece that lives outside. Um, and it is, um, it's, um, I'm working on a piece now here at my parents that's quite large, taller, and um, creates um, you know, optical color illusions and casts on the landscape. And really, um, in, in, in thinking about the ethnobotanicals of this land, um, and thinking about like um, Harriet Tubman's journey, um, and some of her, you know, the, the the marshes that she went through, what type of plants come from there, what did she use them as, and trying to kind of collage and make these this type of um, this type of um, piece as a homage to her. Um, and this was the last um, part. Do I have time just to read this or probably not? What time is it? 7.03, oh, I'm over. Seven. Okay. I think we're gonna say um, good night to folks. Well, how long is it, Heidi? It's real quick, I'll, I'll just read it. Um, the person who made me is here somewhere. She's fluttering around the party, going from person to person, from fire to fire. The sound of the creek and the swishing of the trees is being drowned out by the loud boom of fireworks. Why do humans like to see fires in the sky? Maybe it reminds them of their victories over other species. I'm fairly certain she, my maker, is hallucinating as a result of ingesting magic mushrooms. Part of my torso is a bundle of yellow mu oyster mushrooms. That's this part. She harvests from a male. She harvests it from a male order kit. They are insulated with a taut piece of plastic that collects condensation. My base is a reflective piece of display glass that includes various optical devices, prisms, lenses, and photogels. It splits the tiny flickers of white light falling through the trees into specimens of colors. There's a literal space and a phenomenal space. My skin is a plastic casing and my late layered insides have pockets of bubbles that suggest its cellular respiration. I expand and contract, but no one can see it. A hyper object, the plastic skin will shed and outlive us all. I'm an odd mix of hyper real. So obviously I'll end it on that. It was written from the perspective of the sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. Uh, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you and, and getting a little bit more of the nitty gritty into your studio and uh, your background, your heritage and 
um, how much nature influences your work is certainly obvious, but I really didn't realize uh, just how deeply it does. Uh, I'm really so thankful, Heidi. And congratulations on your show at Grimm. What? Yeah, I know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group show, um, but it's a four-person group show, and I'm going to have four pieces, so I'm excited about that. Yeah. That is really incredible. I love leaving it on a high note, and I'm so thankful for all of you to have joined us tonight on and, and, and this Zoom call, the virtual studio visit session. Follow us on YouTube. We've got about 13 up now on Art Fair's YouTube site, and next week, for July 2nd, we have Azikawe Muhammad speaking again from 6 to 7 EST. Thanks for putting up with that, Heidi. <laughs> thank you so much, you guys, for coming. It was such a pleasure to share my work. So yeah. thank you so, so much. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank it you. Really cool cat showed up. Peace, y'all, and happy day. <laughs> thank you. Love Bye. you guys. <laughs>